प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू माय चैनल एंड प्रेस बेल आइकन सो यू विल नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट फॉर अपकमिंग वीडियोस एंड डोंट फॉरगेट टू लाइक थैंक यू सो मच फॉर सो आई एम अ प्रोडक्ट ऑफ सी एफ टी आई टू So this uh, area of cold plasma is something um, I started working on um, right when I was in CFI uh, as a as a master student. So I was playing a game which was called uh, Halo from Microsoft back in 2008. And there was a plasma gun there, and I was curious uh, what what this plasma is all about. So I went down to the uh, the common internet room at that time, and I started searching about it. There's a small Google AdSense on the side that said uh, you can use plasma for medical applications and uh, that's where I got curious about it, I started searching about it and, uh, and I wrote my first proposal after my masters and I got into my PhD in the same area. So this is, that's a brief history of where this whole story started. Uh, so this is a technology uh, which is something I feel like it is a platform technology, has multiple applications and, uh, and people are evaluating it right now. I felt like I won't be able to cover every application because I will show you the range of applications this has. So my idea is only to help you understand the technology, the gold plasma technology, give you a, a, a good understanding of the fundamentals of this and then provide an overview of the applications. And uh, I am hoping that this will inspire you to connect the dots and, and find some niche applications uh, in your domain. Um, so it's, it's about your creativity after that. So that's uh, to start with the fundamentals of the technology. So what you see there is uh, the nice glow people always get uh, uh, feel, feel like this is some kind of a sciencey thing. Uh, so that's basically inside a 12 centimeter high package. Uh, we have some helium, small pieces of helium filled in, and there is some uh, walnuts in there to get rid of the fungus on there. So uh, to quickly start with, uh, to, to review what plasma is. So we all know that uh, we have solids and when we provide more energy, we, we add energy in the form of uh, heat or let's say physicists would like to call it as, as a thermodynamic or thermal energy. That becomes liquid and then it becomes gas and then what happens when you further add energy to a gas? That's the state where it gets ionized and it becomes plasma. So plasma is the fancy name of basically any ionized gas. Uh, or uh, physicists usually tend to study in a different way. Uh, they call it as the condensed matter physics because you start with plasma, it condenses down to gas, it condenses down to liquid, and further condenses to a solid in a, in a much uh, uh, stable way. Um, plasma occur naturally in, in uh, our planet, and uh, what you see there is uh, uh, is the aurora there on the, the picture on the left. So that happens in the ionosphere region. So it's basically the gas is getting ionized and then you see all those uh, uh, different color lights because those are the transitions of the electrons which happen uh, in nitrogen and other gases uh, which are out there. Uh, so likewise the uh, lightning from cloud to uh, ground is also a plasma but it is thermal plasma of course uh, it, is, uh, it can kill anyone so it is it's because of the heat. And what you see here is the fluorescent lamps. Of course, all fluorescent lamps are essentially uh, plasmas, but they are slightly under a, a lower pressure. And uh, the ozonators that they use in the swimming pools, they are essentially plasmas as well. It says that you use uh, more of oxygen and you ionize the oxygen, and that's how you generate the ozone. So, uh, so what are the uh, typical sources of plasma which have technological applications. So one is the most common one which all study about that is like the corona discharges which is basically a point to plane or a point to uh, a wire kind of discharges. Here the idea is basically we have classically different radial curvature and the electrons at the tip flow straight away onto the, onto the, uh, to the ground electrode. So basically one of the uh, electrodes is at a uh, 
one of the electrodes is at a, uh, at a very high uh, potential, like the pin electrodes in this case, and then you have a ground electrode, and when the electrons flow, that's what you see as they glow, that's basically because of nitrogen in this case. Um, so these were commonly used uh, in all cases for ozone generation in the past. But more recently, the focus has shifted to something called as a dielectric by discharge. Here the idea is you essentially have uh, uh, two electrodes. This is an electrode, this is an electrode. Basically they are metal electrodes. And then you add two dielectric layers, basically non-conducting layers, in which the electrons can rearrange between themselves. So if you try to think of this, if we don't have a dielectric, what happens? It's basically like shorting out. So there will be a big spark and the fuse will blow off. That's what is going to happen. But once you introduce these dielectric layers, they will be limit the current and that's how you get a nice flow, steady flow of electrons. It's basically a stochastic process uh, that occurs there. Okay, moving on, what you can do is you can also generate a surface barrier discharge, which is basically uh, to shift the electrodes a bit and uh, let them join through the through the uh, through the dielectric, and then they will jump. They will jump from one end of the electrode to the other. That's how you make a surface barrier discharge. Uh, these are uh, these are these were most commonly used in the aircraft industry, and uh, before it was uh, recently uh, brought into for medical applications and for uh, for food applications. Okay, now if I take the dielectric barrier discharge, the one that I showed here, and I just give it a 90 degree turn then it becomes a jet. So now you can actually localize the plasma which is coming out. The ionized gas can be localized and this is very suitable for medical applications like for wound healing or for cancer treatment where you need very specific uh, uh, localized treatment with ionized gases. And of course we also have microwave plasmas which are not very common because they are thermal in nature, you need to cool down. They are, but the advantage is they are electrodeless. And uh, some of the recent innovations also include use of uh, uh, high energy ultraviolet light to break down the gas and, uh, and to, to ionize the gas that way. So this is a patented process from Biozone Scientific. This is the only unique process other than what was known historically. Uh, and uh, the DVD discharges can only be operated uh, using alternating current, not with uh, direct current, whereas the other soil uh, except the surface layer discharge can be operated uh, using DC as well as AC. Um, so, to, to quickly tell you what is the difference. So, I told you in the beginning that we have this cloud to ground lightning, which is thermal plasma, which is at very high temperature. And I told you some of the things like the fluorescent lamps are at very low temperature. Um, so, that's a very vague definition. The, the idea is, uh, we have something called as thermodynamic non-equilibrium. And to explain that, if you remember from your high school physics, uh, so that's the that's the diagram you have seen with the billiards board and all that for momentum transfer. So when we apply electric field to a gas, uh, as soon as the electron is emitted out, uh, it will go and hit the atom or molecule. And the mass of the electron is much less than the mass of the atom or molecule. So because of this disparity in, uh, in the masses, we know from conservation of momentum and from conservation of internal energy, that the electron will uh, get to a very high temperature compared to the molecule or atom. So um, that's why what happens is the temperature of the electrons is usually much higher than the temperature of the, uh, the atoms or molecules. Uh, so this you call as thermodynamic non-equilibrium and that's how the overall gas temperature is like still close to room temperature in case of atmospheric pressure plasmas. But in case of uh, in case of the conventional thermal plasmas, the temperature of the electron is also the same as the temperature of the ions or, or the, the fragmented atoms or molecules. Uh, in that case, the degree of ionization is very high. That's what it means. It's a bit, bit involved in physics, but yeah. Alright, so there are essentially four processes which drive the chemistry in plasma. It's the attachment reactions, the excitation, the ionization and the dissociation, which we all have studied again in high school. So the idea is we have, we energize a gas using uh, electric fields and that results in these four basic uh, physical processes and that drives the chemistry. So now I can change the gas, I can change the strength of the electric field and I can generate entirely different chemistries inside the gas which I can use for my own application. So, 
So when I talk about all this process, people usually tend to relate this thing to, uh, to, to gamma radiation or electron beam or X-rays. So I just want to clarify here. So if you if you try to think of the energies, we can see that in case of X-rays and electron beam, the energies are in the order of 10 to the power of 6 in, in mega electron volts. Electron volt is basically a measure of energy or temperature uh, resistant to use. And uh, in case of cold plasma, if you see, uh, the bond energies which you are making down in the order of electron volts. So it's, it's a, a, a million order less than that of those ones. So that's why uh, it is not ionizing radiation, it is not radioactive. I just want to clarify this. So now I just mentioned that we can drive unique chemistries in gases uh, by changing the gas, by changing the, uh, the electric field strength, and several other parameters, of course, uh, by adding humidity or not. Those kind of stuff. So we, my idea here is to tell you that if we are able to control the gas chemistry, the, the ions that we are creating, we can drive multiple uh, applications out of that. So how do we study uh, the chemistry of this, uh, this, this uh, ionized gases? It's very difficult because the reactions occur over a wide range of length scales, from the atomic scale all the way to the scale of the reactor itself. And, uh, and also at varying time scales, which can range from nanoseconds all the way to uh, hours. Um, so we study that using emission spectroscopy. So basically, the light that is emitted by plasma can be used to uh, to understand the chemistry by using spectroscopic method, just like what you do in atomic emission spectroscopy. And uh, yes. also, you can shine light through that yes. plasma, mm. and then look at the. Uh, light that is absorbed and just apply the simple beer lambert law and apply some computational methods and find out the species that is present. Mm -hmm. That's how you can find out the concentrations of all these uh, reactive species that you see there in the gas phase. Uh, I think this is the right time to introduce about the technology where I have focused a lot uh, all through my PhD, my postdoc, uh, my career in the last 10 years. Um, so here I'm showing you something that the setup that, that we use to generate this kind of plasma. So we have a high voltage transformer, it's a step of transformer, you can regulate the voltage that is coming out. You apply that to two electrodes and then you have uh, the dielectric barrier in between which prevents to a spark transition, basically makes a discharge uniform, makes it look like a glow. Uh, and then you can put a actually package in between those two dielectrics and uh, then you can, uh, you can ionize the gas inside the package. In this case the package is also part of the process, it acts like a dielectric again because they are polymers. Now I can uh, I can take the light that is emitted, pass it to a spectrometer, and find out the transitions. I can use a source light and then of well defined source light, like in the UV visible region. I look at the light that is absorbed and, and uh, measure the uh, the concentration of reactive species inside. So the idea is very simple here. I take a product inside a package and it has air or modified gas, it is sealed. And then I give a plasma treatment and subject it to a high electric field. The gas inside is ionized, and we create this unique chemistry of reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, which have antimicrobial properties. Um, and then, if I let it stand for a couple of hours, four to six hours, because they are quasi stable, they will recombine back and form the original gas. But in the meantime, they would have done their action of killing the microorganisms. So, this is more like, uh, if you can think of, like, uh, uh, like canning in one sense. Okay, so I want to tell you here, so what happens like, so this is uh, emission spectrum of the gas uh, in, in, in air, where I have some weak grains present in there, and all these peaks that you see over different wavelengths, they correspond to the transition of the, the nitrogen. As the electron is uh, falling down, it is emitting at a very specific wavelength, and uh, hopefully this gives an idea that there is a reaction happening uh, with a breakdown of nitrogen in there, and then we have... Uh, some oxygen peaks there, and then we have a hydroxyl peak at a very uh, low intensity, close to a 300 nanometer region. So that peak just indicates that it is at a very low temperature. But in the thermal plasma, you will see a very strong peak. Uh, okay, here is some uh, results from my absorption spectroscopy. Uh, so I'm trying to show here, like this is done at 60 kilovolt, and I, I put it, uh, I apply electric field of 60 kilovolt across it across the gap of 4.2 cm inside an empty package and then I am doing a continuous measurement. So this kind of measurement was never done before uh, even by physicists uh, simply because uh, 
at that time those facilities were not available. So I have written my own software course, I have written my own hardware uh, to do these measurements. So one of the interesting story here I would like to share is I was trying to get some uh, some kind of a system to align my fiber optic cables to bring the light in and then take the light again from the package to the spectrum meter. Um, so I was not able to find anything which was uh, suitable or like uh, within my price or my, my budget range like it was like very costly the quotations that I got. So I decided to make a, a model by myself and get it 3D printed. That's what I use to align the uh, fiber optic cables. So right now I have the full hardware to measure these concentrations. So you can see here like we reach roughly about uh, 1250, 1300 degree in that case within like 5 minutes of treatment which is roughly 300 seconds, actually 30 seconds. And that's the order of course on the that I'm seeing there, the nitrogen oxide, nitrogen trioxide and some peroxide of course with that and silicon oxide. Uh, so these are all uh, antimicrobial species and I can vary them by changing the voltage. So here in this case you will see the gas chemistry, the dynamics completely changes and I reach a value of roughly 1350 to 1400 ppm in the same, in only 45 seconds, in just 45 seconds, if I increase the voltage to 90 kV, 90 kV, 9000 volts. So, understanding the gas chemistry and being able to control is what will drive the innovation in this case, that's what I'm trying to say. One another concept is the uh, plasma activated motor, which is basically, you take the plasma in the gas phase and then you let it diffuse into a liquid and this Reactive species that form the liquid, they can they are very stable and they can be kept for up to weeks. So you can use them for uh, for, for washing of fruits and vegetables in one sense. Can you please summarize? Uh, yes, sure. So as here you see we are producing nitride, nitrate and peroxide in, in, in liquids. Uh, those are the ones that are the roughly micromolar. Uh, so this was just to summarize like how these are different mechanisms that were proposed, uh, very well uh, reviewed like how it acts on the bacteria. Uh, so basically it attacks the proteins, the reactive species attack the proteins, uh, liquids, fatty acids, nucleic acids. Um, so I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, so I'll quickly summarize the applications. So uh, coming to the applications, uh, you see here uh, right now the first application is all about applications in agriculture that I won't talk about. Right now we have a very messy situation in the existing agriculture with all these problems, new press test site for fertilizer related to environment problems and those kinds of stuff. And uh, how can we use cold plasma to address that? That's one of the uh, research that I'm working on. And of course the food loss is something, you know, this is from FAO's website, nothing new. So that's my second area of the food technology it's, it's, I have to address this. And food safety is another challenge, like we just saw today's news what happened in the Brasile and all that story. So we need to we need to address this. Uh, so these are these are the agenda which is driving my research. So here is a summary of the applications, how we can use cold plasma. So basically the microwave inactivation I just mentioned, that's what uh, I worked for the big part of my foundation, uh, four or five years in this area. We can do, we can control insect population by, uh, by uh, letting the ionized gas flow, flow through a column of uh, uh, the grains. We can also do nitrogen fixation in the sense that I can take the gas, ionized nitrogen and then let uh, nitrogen nitrogen from inside the liquid. I can use it for agriculture application. Of course I told about enzyme activation as well. I can modify the ingredients. I can modify the properties by producing new oxygen groups on this on surface. I can enhance the germination as well by causing pitting on the surface of the seeds, which can have application in brewing and mining industry. I can modify the uh, structure of the food. I can take that nitrite and then use it for emulsion type sausage, it's a very good process. I can use one of the knives, cutting knives as an electrode and I can let that get uh, real time uh, disinfected as I do the process. I can decontaminate the package itself when I do the package uh, processing. I can go and use it for water treatment, Michelle. multiple applications. Yeah, sure. uh, you can use for uh, pesticide abatement and for uh, breaking down of volatile compounds. So this is all some